Good morning to all of you, my dear friends. Coming from Don Bosco Youth Services, we bring you Bosco Bites. Now, what is Bosco Bites? Bosco Bites is a whole series of encounters that Don Bosco had with his boys. We will look at how he spoke to them, what was the invitation he gave them, what was his spirituality, what was the dialogue, what was the transformation that took place among these many boys. And so today we'll start with our first episode where Don Bosco meets a young boy called Peter and Rhea. 1854, we are in Turin. And what is happening around Turin? There is the great railway being built between Genoa and Turin. And because of this, there is a lot of development. People are migrating to Turin for work. People are coming in from Naples, from Tuscany, from Lombardy, from Genoa. And as a result, there is a population growth. We are told that the population in Turin at this time is around 130,000. Now what happens during this time? During this time, Turin faces a very reverse side of development. People are forced to leave their homes looking for work. They arrive in the city. There is no place to stay, no proper housing. And since wages were low, poverty spread quickly. And so it is in the summer of 1854 Cholera broke out and by the end of July, the first cases of the disease are already reported in Turin. Looking around, we see people vomiting. There is diarrhea, there is dehydration, there is intense thirst, there is strong muscle cramps. These were the symptoms of those who were affected. We are told by the time the cholera epidemic subsided, 50% of the population had died. And in Turin itself, more than 500 people died by the end of the first month of July. Now, in Waldoko, there were two quarantine hospitals to the west of Waldoko. And very few people were ready to come there and volunteer. The heat was stifling, the work was intense, the stench was foul and volunteers were constantly exposed to the danger of contamination. Among some of the priests that came to help the sick was Don Bosco. His youngsters took turns acting as reinforcements. Don Bosco himself will write 14 volunteered at once and a few days later 30 of them enlisted in the cause and we all know that the young saintly Dominic Savio was one of those who volunteered to help all those who were infected by cholera. A few months in the autumn the epidemic completed its slaughter of human life. A total of 320,000 people died all over Italy and in Turin itself, 1,248 lost their lives. Exhausted after the tragedy of the epidemic, the city now faced a new and painful scourge. And what was it? There were orphans all over the city. Urged by his faith and his deep love for youngsters, Don Bosco took 20 of them to the oratory immediately. Let's listen to the conversation that takes place between Peter Andrea and Don Bosco. Peter Andrea writes later on, I came to know Don Bosco in September 1854 at the house of the Dominicans where the little orphans were kept as the cholera raged outside. We were a hundred of us and Don Bosco came to visit us accompanied by the rector of the orphanage. I had never seen him before, but he had a smile on his face and he exuded so much goodness and it made me love him even before I spoke to him. 
He smiled at everyone. He proceeded to ask each one their names, their surnames. And then he asked them, Do you know your catechism? Have you received your first Holy Communion? Have you made your confession? He finally reached me. I had never heard my heart pound so fast, not out of fear, but out of love I felt for him. And then he asked me my name, my surname, and he went on. Do you want to come with me? We will always be good friends right up to the time we go to heaven. Is that all right with you, Peter? I answered, oh yes, sir. And then Don Bosco said, and what about your young brother? Well, I'll bring him too. There must have been something special about Don Bosco if that little boy, Peter Andrea said, something made me love him even before I spoke to him. There was something special in the aspect of his gaze, his smile, his eyes, and his deportment. Certainly, his cheerfulness, his goodness, his sincerity, his serenity, his faith, and his inner peace stemmed from his constant union with the Lord. Boys felt so secure and safe because of this. Don Bosco was interested in each orphan boy. He asked them his name, his surname. It was so personal, there was nothing generic about it. And therefore he would immediately ask the boys about their spiritual welfare. How frequently did they attend catechism classes? Did they go for confession? Did they receive the sacrament of reconciliation? And then that beautiful question, do you want to come with me? Don Bosco, my dear friends, never promised them money. He never promised them success. He never promised them fame. But he promised them friends, promised them the love of a father, and he promised them the salvation of their souls. Peter Andrea will continue to write, he says, in the first few days, after meeting Don Bosco, we were invited to the oratory. I was 13 years old and my brother was only 11. My mother died of cholera and my dad was very, very sick. And at that time, Don Bosco received about 50 orphans at the oratory. From the moment we stepped into the oratory of Don Bosco, ah, we met his mother, Mama Margaret. What a woman! Wow! She welcomed us with a great tenderness. We belonged to her. She was our mother. In the testimony of the boys of Don Bosco, the word love often featured in reference to the way in which this holy priest welcomed them and conversed with them. He was interested in their physical well-being, their social and emotional being, their intellectual being, but more so their spiritual being. But Don Bosco's love, my dear friends, was demanding. Peter and Rhea writes, on entering the oratory, we were warmly welcomed by Don Bosco and his mother. Don Bosco said to me, remember, Andrea, we will always be good friends. But you, you must always be good and virtuous. Don Bosco was truly and completely a father. Peter Andrea says, we were always happy to be around him. He spoke to us with such confidentiality, telling us about his dreams that he had the previous night. From the moment the boys entered the oratory, Don Bosco treated them as his own children and they felt that he was their father. Each one of them was their, was his beloved. He confided in them as a father confides in his own children. 
Like a true father, he never spared himself. Don Bosco was constantly working for us. Andrea still remembers. He writes, he was the first to be found in the church in the morning. The winter of 1854 was severely cold. The church was so cold at that time when Don Bosco celebrated Mass. His hands were so frozen that he was unable to lift up the chalice of wine with his fingers. And yet, he never complained. Don Bosco was always happy and content to be able to sustain us and the many works he had started. Let me tell you, Don Bosco suffered many humiliations when he went out knocking on the doors of the rich for the sake of poor boys like me. Most often he was rejected, he was hurt, he was insulted, but Don Bosco continued. He continued to walk the streets, he continued to beg. I remember one day, Mama Margaret coming to Don Bosco and shouting at him and saying, you continue to accept so many boys. We have nothing to cover them with. And then, how do we feed them? We have nothing. My brother and I slept on the floor, writes Peter and Rhea. We slept on a floor covered with a few leaves. Ah, but we were content. We slept as though we were in cozy feather beds. Because we felt loved and supported by Don Bosco, we would overcome any difficulties. 1857, the year now is 1888. January 31st, 1888, at dawn, Don Bosco died. And at his bedside was a 47-year-old Salesian, Peter Andrea. What a privilege! What a privilege to be found by a saint, to be educated and accompanied and transformed by a saint, and more so, to become a Salesian alongside the great saint Don Bosco. My dear friends of Don Bosco, the opportunity that Don Bosco had is also an, an opportunity that is there in front of us each day. The young, the migrant worker, the orphaned child, the migrant, the marginalized, they are all around us, on our streets, in our marketplaces, in our countryside in our sprawling cities. But like Don Bosco, can we reach out to them? For Don Bosco, there was no nameless or a faceless one. Don Bosco took the time to, to look into their eyes. Don Bosco took the time to learn their names. This is the challenge that Don Bosco's encounter with Peter and Rhea will give each one of us. Can we reach out to those many faceless and nameless ones that roam our streets? The orphans, the migrants, the marginalized ones, those that society has pushed aside. Every youngster, my dear friends, has a life to live, a dream to achieve, a mind to be educated, a soul to be saved. Don Bosco needs you. He needs me. The great challenge to us is, am I ready to take up the call of Don Bosco? As a past pupil of Don Bosco, as a parent of a Salesian, as a Salesian myself, as friends and benefactors of Don Bosco, let us join hands. Let us join hands to make the world of the young the way Don Bosco wanted it always to be. May God bless you. Thank you very much.